I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. I'm Andrew Falkowski, and I'm an undergraduate student in material science and engineering here at the University of Utah. I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host, Taylor Sparks. Today, we're also joined by a friend of mine, Dr. Benjamin Franzen. He's an assistant professor of physics at BYU, and he's also an expert on the study of atomic and magnetic structures in quantum materials using X-rays, neutrons, and muons. That's a mouthful. We're going to explain what some of that means today. So, Ben, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks a lot, first of all, for having me here. I'm uh, excited to be on the Materialism Podcast. Uh, So, yeah, I'm at Brigham Young University. Now, the University of Utah and Brigham Young University are not known to be friends, at least on the football field. So I, I uh, had to dress incognito to get into the uh, on campus here. No, but if anything, I think this podcast shows that science really bridges gaps. BYU and Utah together, this is a great, a great thing. So, yeah, I do um, experimental studies of superconductors and magnets and, and other interesting materials like that using primarily beams of X-rays and neutrons, using some of the techniques we're going to talk about today. But the key is really to, to understand the structure of these materials, which is, which is really crucial to everything in material science. So structure, that's, that's, that's what this episode is going to be all about. Um, scientists have been trying to figure out how materials come together. What is their, you know, at the tiniest level, what is their structure for a very long time? So what we've got today is a series of articles that we're going to be reviewing and talking about from um, a nature series of what are called milestones of crystallography. So this was published in 2014, and there's 24 of them, and we're going to spend sort of more time on some than others. But it introduces a really interesting progression of how scientists have tackled this problem over the years, and it goes all the way back to the 18th century, right? Way, way back. The scientists back then did not have any of the valuable tools that we have today. So when they wanted to study the crystallinity or like the structure of materials, all they could do was dig up gemstones, look at like the facets, which are like the faces, how they come together. If you've seen like a diamond, like the the cartoon always has like that sort of specific shape. These things tend to have certain facets that occur and they would basically measure the angles between those and then they'd sort of guess what the structure, underlying structure might be. Like salt crystals, for example, if you look at them in a microscope, they're cubic. It's like a little cube of salt. You can see that uh, with your table salt too. So next time you spill a little uh, salt on the table, take a look. You'll see they're little cuboids. Yeah, absolutely. And then other things might be like hexagons or other weird shapes. And so they started realizing, oh, and it's always this way. Therefore, there must be something about the whatever they are. I don't even think they called them atoms at the time. But like the smallest units of matter must be arranging maybe in like a cubic arrangement. Um, So in 1781, there was this guy, René Jusoy. He was a Parisian priest. Um, and he was basically looking over his friend's, you know, collection of some crystals. I think these were, so it says prismatic calcite crystals. And uh, he dropped it, as the story goes, and it shattered on the floor. And when it shattered on the floor, he looked at it, and these things were like the same sort of morphology or the same sort of faceting and shapes, but just on a smaller scale, which led them to really realize, oh, okay, so these things really are, if you break them up, they're, they have like a repeating unit cell because they're the same shape over and over to smaller. Um, so this was the birth of this idea that crystals are periodic. What does periodic mean? Yeah, periodic means it repeats itself over and over and over again. So uh, this, this introduces the idea of a unit cell, the smallest building block of a, of a material. So you think of, of like blocks that little kids play with. You got these, these cubes and you can stack them together to form a bigger structure. So, so each individual block would represent a unit cell. So it's uh, an, an identical repeating pattern throughout the crystal. But, you know, let me go back for a question. Uh, René Just Hoy, um, his, his friend invites him over to look at these beautiful crystals. The first thing he does is <laughs> drop it on the ground. Do you think they were friends after that? I, I don't know. Like, so I'm not, I, I know several of my students are like gem collectors and they guard these things like they are just <laughs> precious to them. And I don't think that they would love it if I dropped and broke one of theirs. Well, if we sacrifice one friendship for the birth of crystallography, then hopefully it was worth it. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think calcite's pretty easy to make. That's true. <laughs> so fast forward. Now we're in the eight, uh, 1800s. 
There's a guy named Moritz Frankenheim in 1826, and a few years later, Johann Hessel. And they basically said, all right, if there, there are these little tiny building blocks, imagine Legos. What if you start putting these Legos together in different ways, right? There's only a certain number of ways that you can put together a repeating shape to fill all space. And filling all space is a requirement, right? So if you translate these things, meaning you move it side to side or up and down, you're going to have to be able to fill all space. And they realize that, okay, you can rotate it like 180 degrees or 120 degrees or, or 60 degrees. You can do the, a few like known rotations, but you can't just pick any sort of way of arranging them. Only some of them will work. So that led to what they called these 32 possible crystal classes. Fast forward a little bit later, you've got Arthur Schoenflies and uh, Evgra Fedorov, and these basically build on this previous work. And by 1891, mathematics and physics had come together and basically said, like, we can't think of any other way to assemble these together to get a unique crystal structure other than the 230 what are called space groups at the time. So what are space groups good for? Space groups are a, a, a compact mathematical way of describing the types of symmetry you have in your structure. So if you, if you take your material, you take your unit cell, and you, you flip it or you rotate it by a certain amount, and then, you, and, and then you look again, you'll see it's identical to how it was before. So those symmetry elements can be classified in these 230 space groups. So there's a lot of math behind it. There's, there's group theory. You know, our modern understanding really relies on group theory. Um, but it's really amazing to me that in, in the 1800s still, before we actually knew how to determine the structure of crystals, they had actually they figured, figured out, out every, they, they figured every out. possible crystal structure. We, that's really amazing. We haven't really added anything with the exception of one that we'll talk about later today. But that's pretty impressive. They're really using is. mathematics and like models alone that they were able to figure it out. So we've set the stage. Um, there's been no really advanced diffraction, which is the point of this episode up until now. But... We're getting closer. Andrew, you want to tell us what happened? Yeah. yeah, so fast forward to 1912. You have Max von Laue, and he's an associate professor at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Munich. And so he asks his colleague, Paul Ewald, what would happen if you assumed very much shorter waves to travel in the crystal? And this conversation basically turned into the basis for modern crystallography. And these shorter waves that he's referring to are X-rays. And to sort of go into the sort of history of these briefly, these were discovered by Wilhelm Rontgen in 1895. And how he came about these was he was experimenting with something called the Crookes tube. And this is essentially a sealed glass tube with an anode and a cathode within it. And when you applied a high enough voltage across the anode and a cathode, you'd see this green light that would appear on the glass. And for a while, nobody really knew what this was. People thought it was like ether, which at the time was assumed to be the material that filled the space between the heavens and the earth. Others thought it was ectoplasm, like the, the Ghostbusters stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the course of his experimentation, he has this barium platinum cyanide screen behind him in his lab. And he starts to notice that as he's experimenting with the Crookes tube, it starts to glow. And so he becomes really interested in this. He's like, why, why is this glowing when this is on? And he's not the first scientist to note that when this is on, photosensitive materials glow or exhibit, you know, the influence of light on them. But at the time, most scientists were mostly just concerned with what was happening inside of the tube. So I read a little bit about this. There's this cool excerpt. You know, he discovers this thing. He doesn't know what it is. And so he calls them X-rays because he's like, well, I'll just put X for now because it's something unknown. And little did he know that that name was going to stick and sound like a comic book, you know, superpower. Um, but it's cool. It says that he ate and slept in his laboratory as he was investigating these things. Like he was so passionate, excited about this because this was really at the cusp of something really big and he knew it. So he's excited to learn more about it. One of the experiments he does is he tries to block these x-rays from exiting the tube. So he starts putting materials around it and he's using the, um, the barium planet aside eyed screen as his sort of metric to see if it blocks it. And as he's putting a piece of lead in there to try and test that, he notices his skeleton on the on the screen. Like going through his hand, you mean? Mm -hmm. and yeah, so, like the, the bones of his hand, yeah. That would have been spooky. <laughs> yeah, so like already there's all this sort of mythology being created around what this green light is, and now he's seeing his skeleton. I, I can't imagine. And so once he sees this, he decides that he's going to put all of his work into sort of secrecy. He doesn't want it getting out that maybe like he's crazy or something for discovering this, so he continues all his work in secret at this point. He does show his wife, I thought this is cool, so she takes an x-ray, you know, a radiograph of her hand and sees the bones and says, I've seen my death, right? <laughs> and it was wild. Yeah. Um, sort of in the years following this, though, taking images, like what we now call x-ray images, um, this became really popular. In the turn of the century, they were doing it like all over the place because they didn't realize the potential harm 
of these high energies x-rays hitting your hand. So they were taking images. They'd you know, like have couples holding hands. You can see the wedding rings of like skeleton hands. It was really popular at the time. Um, but these did have some long-lasting negative impacts. Röntgen himself actually died of cancer, right? He had carcinoma in his intestine, um, not so unlike, you know, I think, uh, Curie. The yeah, also Marie Curie, experiments. Pierre Curie. Yeah, they, they also gave their lives, in a sense, for their research. So <clears throat> so one last thing uh, before we I guess, move on from him is I just think Röntgen is really one of these heroes that I admire. One of the things that he did that I just absolutely am amazed by is he he wins a Nobel Prize for this discovery, um, which at the time and still today it comes with a big monetary prize. Some people don't realize that. It's actually a big amount of money. He, he gives the money to his university, and then critically, he doesn't take out a patent on this, on the, the ability to generate x-rays, because he knew that these things were going to help improve science in ways that he didn't yet understand, and it would be foolish for him to say, basically wall it off and say, only I can work on these. He wanted everybody to. Like, I just, in, in 2019, that feels like such an abstract concept because it's so driven by competition, and like everybody wants to be the first, and so to see somebody like so philanthropic about their discovery is just inspiring, I think. Yeah. I wonder if let's let's take a step back and think about why X-rays were important in the first place. So, um, you you can think of um, you think of interference patterns. Uh, maybe you've you've seen the the two slit interference pattern in a science class or something. Um, but you can you can shine light through two closely spaced openings, and you'll see um, patterns of brightness and darkness, and and that actually relates to the to the distance between the, the slits. So the idea of why x-rays might be useful is x-rays, um, as was later found out, have a much smaller wavelength than typical light rays that, that our eyes can see. And in order to get information about how things are arranged in space, you need, you need a wavelength to be about the same size as the spacing between the things you're looking at, okay? so. People could guess that atoms, you know, that whatever was making up materials were very closely spaced. And so you would need something with very small wavelength to, to really be able to see that. And that's why x-rays were so important. And that's why they really kind of opened the door for structure determination on the atomic scale uh, because they have high energy and short wavelength. And so that's why the discovery of, of Röntgen and, and learning how to generate and use these x-rays really was crucial for making more progress. So that hypothesis that Ben just you know explained for us, that was the exact hypothesis that Lowy had in 1912, right? So he basically says, all right, we've got these x-rays that Röntgen figured out how to make for us. If I direct them at a sample, I think he was doing his first experiment in transmission, meaning the x-rays hit the sample, they traveled through it. If it went straight through um, and there's a little point of light on the backside, then they didn't diffract. But if it goes through and then there's some scattering, so there's additional basically rings or peaks that are not at the exact same uh, initial trajectory but are like deflected a little bit, that's evidence that they're scattering, right? And once that happens, that's a big, big deal. Or in the words of Albert Einstein, when they did this experiment, he said about that experiment when it was published, this is among the most glorious that physics has seen so far, right? This was a big deal and everybody knew it. And it wasn't long after that that people started saying, all right, Things diffract. How can we use that to figure out structure? Which brings us to 1913, just a year later, Bragg's Law, right? So Bragg and Bragg are interesting people. This is a father-son combo. Um, I don't know if there's other examples of a father and son that both won the Nobel Prize. Maybe there are. Um, but William, William Lawrence, he's the son. He was only 22 when he did this experiment. I think he's, if not the youngest, certainly among the youngest winners of the Nobel Prize. So these guys are, are in their lab. Um, they know about x-rays. They're familiar now with the Lowy experiments, and they're excited about that. And so they uh, start designing experiments, and they basically say, okay, when you shine light at something, in Lowy, at Lowy's experiment, it was traveling through your sample. But what they said is it might be more convenient to instead rely off of what's called specular reflection. Or in other words, if the x-ray hits your sample and it's coming in at a certain angle, it bounces off at the same angle. Kind of like you've seen like a laser. If you shine it on a mirror, it bounces off that same angle. They said, okay, our x-ray is going to come in. It's going to interact with the sample, and then it's going to bounce off. And the whole crux and what won the Nobel, the Nobel Prize is realizing, okay, light can either be constructive interference or destructive. So if we go back to Ben's example of the double slit exper uh, experiment, when you shine light at the double slit, you see a series of dark and white spots. The dark is where the light is de destructively interfering with one another, and so we don't observe any light actually at a certain point. But at other points, it's constructive, so it's getting magnified. And they said there's probably a distance between the planes of atoms 
And if you can control the angle, then you can figure out what is the, the distance that will cause you to have an equal path length. So what's a path length? That means that your, your X-ray wavelength, if it travels a full uh, wavelength, it goes up and then it comes back down and it comes back up again. If it lines up again with the initial wavelength where it was at when it started, then it's going to have constructive interference. Anything else will be destructive interference and you won't see any light coming out. So in practice, they basically built the very first powder diffractometer and they basically, they lined it up and they figured out that, in fact, there are only certain angles as you introduce this x-ray off of your sample where you see the x-ray coming back out again. So this was a proof of concept that this actually works. And they were even able to calculate some of the very first planar distances showing that crystals are periodic. And now we have a way of figuring out how big that gap is between layers of atoms. So this equation came to be known as Bragg's Law. And it's an equation relating the wavelength of the incoming x-rays to the distance between these uh, atomic planes in the crystal structure, uh, and then the angle that the uh, that the X rays come in and out of, I just want to say that that equation can be understood by a seventh grader or okay maybe a ninth grader doing trigonometry for the first time. It's it's beautifully simple, but it's extremely profound in in terms of how we can understand the structure of materials on the atomic level. It's uh, so I, I love it when there are these incredible advances in science that are actually really simple to understand. And, and this is a great example of that. Yeah, a lot of science gets hidden behind jargon, like this specialized vocab that we all talk. But if you strip it down to the main idea, it's usually really basic concepts. Well, you know, what if we put like an extra layer here or we block this or whatever? Like it's, it's typically basic things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, just, just uh, it, maybe we should introduce one uh, one form of terminology here. So we talk about the phase of, uh, of x-rays sometimes, and what we mean by that is, is how two um, x-ray beams line up with each other. Um, so if they, are, if they are in phase, that means they're in their wavelength pattern, they're going up and down together. If they're out of phase, it means they're mismatched. And, and that's going to be important because it's the phase relationship between x-rays diffracting off of different atoms within the structure, which gives us the diffraction pattern that contains the information about the structure. So that word phase, we'll probably use it going forward. All it means is how these x-rays that are diffracted off of different points in the crystal, how they line up with each other in terms of where they are in their wavelength cycle. So about this time, Braggs and his son continue doing a lot of experiments on this, and his son describes this period as, as a glorious time when they worked far into the night and new worlds were unfolding before their very eyes. And basically at this time, they were solving tons of mysteries about structures, such as solids like diamond. And the first diffractometer that they built, um, they actually used an old spectrometer chassis. Their system was different from Lowy's in that it, it could actually collect the reflected radiation, not just what was transmitted. And so this work that they were doing was incredibly difficult at the same time, you know, mostly because they didn't really know what they were looking for and what they were looking at. They had to kind of make a lot of inferences and try to understand it as they were seeing something that no one had seen. And this was pretty much the first time. And so up until this point, all of the crystals that they had to use in order to do these experiments had to be single crystals. What's a single crystal mean? So a single crystal would be Basically, you have one single arrangement of, of, of the crystals within it. So the unit cells would be in, in one single arrangement. You wouldn't have them oriented in different ways. That would be considered polycrystalline. So if you've seen like a diamond engagement ring, that diamond stone, that's not polycrystalline or pow yeah, polycrystalline as opposed to single crystal. It's going to be a single crystal or a gemstone. And these could just be more expensive. So as a scientist, you don't have a ton of really nice gemstones lying around per se, but it's easy to get powdered up gemstones. Um, and so... The advance of if being able to do experiments on powderized materials is a big deal. So just a few years later, Paul Debye and Paul Scherer, which are names that everyone knows in this field because um, they went on to do great things, they were the first to realize, like, okay, you don't have to just use gemstones. You can take this powder, grind it up, and you can do diffraction on those and get – actually, in some ways, you get additional information because now each one of those little polycrystalline chunks of powder is oriented a different way. So in a single crystal, when you shine the beam, you're going to sample one very explicit arrangement of the atom. But in a powder sample, you get all sorts of different arrangements all at the same time. So it, in some ways, it's beneficial. One really good metaphor for understanding it that I heard was if you think about a sequin pillow, you know, one of those where you brush, brush your hand along it and one side is red and the other it's blue, perhaps. Um, for instance, I brought my brother one. One side it's red. The other side it's Nicholas Cage's face. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one. It's a good one. <laughs> anyway, so if you have a single crystal, it's almost as if you're only looking at the 
the one side, the red side. You would completely miss that Nicolas Cage's face is there. But with this polycrystalline one, you're able to see all those other details that you would have missed otherwise. Mm-hmm. Cool. So to me, it's amazing to think that um, was it uh, was it sodium chloride table salt was one of the first materials that uh, William Henry Bragg and William Lawrence Bragg solved. You know, they solved the structure using this technique, and it's, it's a very common material. You know, t- everyone has salt every single day, but they discovered, they, they determined exactly how those sodium and chlorine ions are arranged in space. And on we're talking angstroms, okay? We're talking a million times smaller than the width of your hair. That's the distance we're talking about. And they, from their analysis, they were able to figure out exactly how these sodium and chlorine atoms are arranged on that length scale, on, on an angstrom length scale. And uh, that's just incredible that we can get that level of detail by looking at these diffraction patterns. And, and sodium chloride is a very simple material. And, and we're going to see, I think, next, how even much more complicated structures can be solved using these diffraction techniques. Yeah, so as you can imagine, once like Bragg um, and his son showed that this can be used to solve a crystal structure, it was like a mad dash. People have been, they'd had these materials all around them for ages, and now all of a sudden you have this tool that can tell us more about the structure. So it didn't take long before they were actually looking at organic structures. So there's a group uh, at the same time in about 1923. One of them was at Caltech and there was one at Berlin. These both independently reported this first sort of determination of an organic molecule. The name is hexamethylene tetraamine. So it's six carbons, 12 hydrogen, four nitrogen, something that would be, you know, people had no clue how to, how to determine this before. But they picked it because even though it's an organic molecule, it has carbon, it's a cubic symmetry, which really makes it a lot easier to figure out its crystal structure. Um, and there's only two molecules per unit cell, which is that small repeating unit. That's like the little Lego brick that you make the larger thing out of. So it was simple. And when they did that, then people started tackling harder problems. Like there's this lady, Kathleen Lonsdale, great scientist. Um, she was the first to actually study benzene. Benzene is a – it's six carbons l- linked in a circle. It's one of like the classic organic chemistry molecules. It shows up all over the place. And people didn't know how it arranged. They knew that it was six carbons with some hydrogens, but and they knew it was a ring, but they didn't know if it was a flat ring, like totally flat, or if it was puckered, meaning like maybe the carbons go up and down as they go around the ring. And she was the first to show by investigating compounds like hexamethylbenzene that, were, that had benzene present – that it was, in fact, totally, totally flat. Um, so really cool investigations were, were coming out around this time, which soon led to them studying things like minerals, which are much harder than a basic salt or a diamond single crystal. And, you know, before we talk about mineral structures, maybe it's worth asking, like, why does it actually matter? Why does it matter what the exact arrangement of atoms is in a structure? So as a material scientist, if someone asks you that, what would you say, Taylor? Yeah, so I mean, material science is at the heart of our discipline is the study of structure-property relationships. And as you change the structure, you change the properties. And so we change the way that we process materials to change the structure because it maybe gives you a different property, right? For example, let's say that atoms are squeezed a little bit closer together. If they're squeezed a little bit closer together, there might be stronger bonding between them, right? So you've all played with plastics, and some of them melt really low temperature, like candle wax melts really low. And then you've got other plastics, which are like, they don't melt hardly at all when you heat them up. And a lot of this is just by, you know, how near or far the atoms are in their layers, right? So that's a very simple property, and there's much more complex ones. But at the heart of all the properties that we care about is typically a structure relationship. Right. So going back to the benzene, you know, okay, who cares if if the six uh, carbon atoms are flat or puckered? Well, actually, we should all care because how these molecules, how these atoms are arranged really determines their macroscopic behaviors. So that's, yeah, thanks. That, that it, It's important to keep in mind, this is not just an intellectual pursuit, although it is an incredibly satisfying intellectual pursuit to figure out the structure of materials, but actually it helps us understand their properties and how to exploit and engineer those properties. So around this time, they're starting to investigate harder things, things that aren't quite so trivial to try and investigate with x-ray, big mineral structures. And there was a guy named Victor Goldschmidt. Um, He basically pointed out that there's some factors that clearly matter when determining crystal structure, things like atomic and ionic radii. And he figured that there's some rules for how these things could basically substitute for one another. And inspired by this work, now we get to Linus Pauling, who's one of these well-known scientists of our era. And he came up with his own rules for how um, ionic crystals should form. And they're basic. It has to do with things like charge balance between the positively charged and the negatively charged atoms in a crystal, how close they like to be together, how do they connect, is it along edges or like faces or 
you know, so these five rules, these were really important and they actually guided how we predict what type of structure something forms in for a really long time. Um, around this time, William Bragg, again, you know, this is the sun. He's a little bit older now, but now he starts investigating silicates. Silicates are tricky because many, many of the minerals that we that are all around us in the dirt and the rocks all around us are based off of silicates, meaning that it has an SiO4 little Lego block to build them. And this SiO4 unit can be put together in lots of different ways. They can be isolated, and that's like in some minerals like olivine, or they can be in chains, or they can be rings or sheets. They can connect in all sorts of different ways. And once he did this research, it really opened up a huge field of understanding the minerals all around us. So to understand the structure of a material, you need to know the size of the unit cell. Okay, so that means like your, your little building block, your Lego, its dimensions basically. But you need to know more than that. You need to know how the atoms are arranged within the unit cell. And that's actually the hard part. So um, it, it's not too difficult to come up with the size of the unit cell looking at diffraction data. Uh, but up until about the 1930s, uh, 1940s, um, the way to figure out how the atoms were arranged within your unit cell, within your Lego block, uh, was basically guess and check. You you maybe use some some other information you may have uh, about the material to come up with a reasonable starting guess, but but then you just guess and check and see if you can eventually find the positions of the atoms that reproduce the diffraction pattern. The reason it's hard is because when we measure these X-rays in the diffraction pattern, um, we're actually we're measuring the intensity of the X-rays, and so we actually lose the phase information that we talked about before that the, the way the X, diffracted X-ray beams align with each other, we lose that information because we're just collecting the intensity, uh, which, which no longer contains that phase information. But it's the phase information that tells us where the atoms are located inside the unit cell. So there's a problem. It's called, it's called the phase problem because we lose the phase, but the phase is what tells us where the atoms are located within the unit cell. So how, how do we solve that? Well, as I said, guess and check is one way. Uh, but there are some other methods called direct methods, which um, have the goal of, of recovering the lost phase information and, and in that way figuring out where the atoms are located. And so the, the first real progress in this direction was uh, in 1934 with a, a scientist named Lindo Patterson. And um, he had the insight that using Fourier theory, Fourier transforms, you can actually relate the, the diffraction pattern um, more directly to physical distances between atoms within your unit cell. Okay, and, and it's it's that those spatial relationships between the atoms within the unit cell that actually set the phase difference between diffracted X-ray beams. So that was a crucial insight, um, and we call it the Patterson function now. When you Fourier transform your diffraction pattern, uh, we call it the Patterson function, uh, and it contains information about the the uh, spatial vectors connecting different atoms within the unit cell, and that information can be used to narrow down. Uh, the the possible the phase problem and and help solve the phase problem using um, probabilistic methods and, and other mathematical methods. So this was the first attempt to actually figure out the phase uh, precisely on its own and and in that way come up with how the atoms are arranged in the, in the um, unit cell. So uh, there were there were other advances as well. Um, direct methods it's still actually an area of of active research. Uh, some other important uh, concepts that were introduced in the in the direct method um, research was oversampling. That means collecting a little more diffraction data than than the bare minimum bare minimum, so that you can have you can reduce your noise and have a more reliable interpretation. Um, you know, recognizing the fact that electron density. Uh, has to be a positive value uh, to have a real material that uh, can also help narrow down this phase search. Uh, so it, it's, it's an ongoing um, research area, actually, but uh, it enables us to have a more sophisticated approach than just guess and check for trying to figure out the structure of these materials. So we're, we're investigating materials. This group of scientists, you know, they're, they're figuring out how to solve harder and harder materials. Direct methods is telling us where exactly the atoms are located. Things are moving right along. And then World War II happens. So what is significant about diffraction when it comes to World War II? Well, the most significant thing is that because of World War II, there was a whole lot of research into nuclear power and, uh, well, and nuclear weapons. Um, and a lot of that research resulted in a much deeper understanding of neutrons. 
So we've been talking about X-rays so far. This is an, X-rays are a form of electromagnetic radiation. Um, now neutrons are particles. Okay, they're in the the nuclei of atoms. They're neutral. Um, and uh, normally we think of needing waves to do a diffraction experiment. Luckily, as we know from quantum mechanics, particles are actually also waves. Okay, so neutrons are waves uh, as well as particles. And we can use the wave nature of neutrons to probe structure and do diffraction experiments just like we can using x-rays. So we have a whole new particle, pro a whole new type of radiation that we can exploit to do structural studies. Yeah, as I was reading this, so one of the, the early guys here, this guy named Ernest Wallen, he was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, they had these basically, he was, a, you know, drafted into the Manhattan Project. So he was certainly working in these reactors. They knew that neutrons were being generated. And so I, it kind of seemed to me like it was a sort of one-off experiment, like, oh, you know, since these things do have a wave and they are, you know, being ejected, we could maybe put a sample in their path and do diffraction on them too, right? So in 1949, it was this little one-page report by... Um, Clifford Scholl and James uh, Samuel Smart. It was in Physical Review, and they basically said, like, yeah, you know, it turns out you see scattering peaks on some material uh, using neutrons. Uh, so, again, it was sort of like a, who knows what this is good for, but, you know, we did it. And um, it completely revolutionized <laughs> it was a big uh, deal. everything in condensed matter physics and in material science. Um, yeah, so so a couple of special things about neutrons. They are neutrally charged, okay, so, so they have no charge. So that means they don't interact with the electrons. They're actually interacting with the nuclei uh, of the atoms as opposed to x-rays which interact with the electrons. So that's, that's one key difference. The other key difference is neutrons have a magnetic moment. So they're like a little tiny bar magnet in a sense. So you can use neutrons to study magnetic structures in materials. So far we've been talking about atomic structures. What's a magnetic structure? A magnetic structure is how the electron spins are arranged within the material. Okay, so if you think of your refrigerator magnets, the reason it works is because there's a, 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 a the, the net electron spin is all pointing in one direction. That's called a ferromagnet. Okay, but there are many other types of, of magnets. There are anti-ferromagnets where electron spins are... Uh, anti-aligned with each other and cancel each other out so that you you don't really notice anti-ferromagnetism on a macroscopic scale. But did, if, they, did they know that it should exist before um, this time? So it had been predicted by Louis Nail, and people basically thought that, yeah, these should exist, but but There's it hadn't no been proven it, yeah. yet. Yeah, it, there was no way to measure it because they cancel each other out on the on the kind of atomic length scale, ancient length scale, so how can we get that? So you can't hold a magnet up to it. You don't measure yeah, anything that exactly, way. Yeah, exactly, you don't. But neutrons are little tiny bar magnets, and we talked about the idea of periodicity before, uh, referring to unit cells and atoms. Well, if your electron spins also have some periodicity, even in an anti-ferromagnetic uh, structure, then the, these little tiny bar magnets, these neutrons, will sense that periodicity and diffract. And so you have new diffraction peaks that appear, which reflect the anti-ferromagnetic structure rather than the atomic structure. Yeah, so I think they showed that. Yeah. One of the next experiments was they took a sample above the temperature where it's, it, it orders magnetically. Above the temperature, it's not ordered, I mean. And then they cool it down, and you see additional peaks show up, right? At room temperature, maybe you have five peaks. You cool it down, and you've got additional peaks there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so those additional peaks are the new periodicities in the material caused by these uh, these anti-ferromagnetic correlations. And this was this is really important as like magnetism is really crucial to to basically all of our modern technology. And uh, using neutrons is now gives us a way to quantitatively look at magnetic structure in a way that that uh, X-rays were not able to do at that point. There's another big advantage that I've used for my own research for neutrons. Even if you're not trying to probe the magnetic structure, neutrons can be a powerful tool for a couple reasons. Uh, for, for one thing, because they interact with the nuclei as opposed to the electron, um, that, that the nucleus, it has what's called the cross section, which basically tells you how much does it interact with that material. It kind of is like random. It looks like random noise when you plot it against like atomic number. It doesn't have like a really obvious trend, whereas X-rays tend to be like the heavier the atom, like the things at the bottom of the periodic table, they scatter more, the light ones scatter less. But neutrons, it's like all over the place. And so let's say you had an alloy that was like two elements right next to each other, like iron and manganese. To X-ray, those are really hard to tell apart. 
But odds are that, and I don't know if this is exactly the case, but they're probably going to have very different neutron scattering cross sections. They do. Yeah, manganese has a negative neutron scattering cross section. Iron has a strong positive one. So you can really easily distinguish between those two and figure out where their positions are in the unit cell. Whereas with x-rays, it will be basically impossible using standard x-ray techniques. And so one of the things that I'm seeing more and more in literature is that people don't rely on just one technique. They sort of hit it with a barrage of techniques, some that we're gonna be talking about in a, in a few moments, and you can learn different clues about your material from these different techniques and take it all together, you get a much more complete picture of what's happening in the material. So World War II gave us uh, nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear power. Um, it gave us neutron diffraction as well, which has been really important for the continued development of crystallography. I was going to say, and if I remember correctly from what I was reading, the Nobel Prize for neutron diffraction was – there was some interesting – it was, it was kind of dicey oh, politically, yeah, that's right? right? Yeah. Because uh, this was a time when there was a lot of scare going around because of these nuclear weapons and this, this new technology comes out and people are – reasonably skeptical about it and what it potentially could do. Well, it got politicized, right? I think it did get awarded to, was it Scholl? Cliff Scholl eventually Scholl got it, right? in the 90s, you know, 40 years after he had done his seminal experiments. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, eventually, and scientists knew this a long time ago, but the public realized this is way, this is a far more powerful tool than just to make weapons. Like, mm -hmm. this is advancing science. It's benefiting all of us in lots of ways. Um, so what else happened next? You know, in the years that followed, what, what are we using all this for, Andrew? Yeah, so we just get... I mean, at this point, it's, it's going at such a rapid pace. You're getting discoveries sort of left and right, and people are looking at different um, applications. So, for instance, they start using X-ray diffraction to determine the spatial arrangement of stereogenic co compounds in organ like organics. And what are those? You'll hear about those when you take like an intro mm -hmm. organic chem class, but what are they? Right. So they're referring to enantiomers, and these are molecules that are essentially just mere images of each other. And but, however, they can't be superimposed on one another. So they look the same if you mirrored them, but they aren't the same. And actually, what you have is basically just a different arrangement of the molecules or the functional groups on these. But these are incredibly important. You'd think, oh, that that slight change like wouldn't wouldn't do much, but it greatly impacts yeah. the like functionality and the structure and the properties. Turns that our body's like really programmed to detect the differences between enantiomers. Right. Yeah. Uh, one instance of this these properties having pretty actually devastating effects was a sedative called, uh, I think it's, okay, I think it's, I think it's thalidomide. Someone can correct me, but essentially one enantiomer, it, it was used in the pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical industry, and one enantiomer would cause the desirable sedative effects, but the other would cause, you know, birth defects in people who used them. And Cancers so, and complications of leprosy. Right. And so this, this enantiomer would appear, you know, 50% of the time. So being able to determine how molecules or what enantiomers are present in, in molecules is incredibly important and has significant ramifications. So next we sort of get into ferrocene, which is another very important sort of, I guess it's organic and inorganic. Um, and you have Peter Paulson or Peter Pawson and his student Tom Keeley, and they create this molecule where they have two cyclopentadiene rings, which are basically just five member rings with double bonds in them. And they are able to bond these to an iron atom. And initially, they think that this molecule is linear. So the iron is outside of the rings, it's, and they're connected in sort of a linear fashion. But it wasn't really until... Well, they, they start doing absorption spectra on this, and they, they basically noticed that the carbon-hydrogen bonds, they're all equivalent, which would mean that it's not linear. Because if, if they were linear, the, the iron would be affecting those the bonds and the, the orbitals. And so it wasn't until they use X-ray X diffraction on this and they start to discover that, well, what is known as the ferrocene structure in which the iron is actually sandwiched between the two rings with the, the rings sort of being like the buns or the bread of a sandwich. And after this, um, they basically just dis discover that you can do this with a bunch of different Yeah, this um, is like metals. a whole field now. They call mm -hmm. these organometallics. Yeah. It's a big, big deal. Take organic molecules, put a metal between them. In fact, they, they got a word for it. It's called chelating when you surround a metal by two other things. They call it chelate because it comes from the Greek word. Where is it? Uh, the Greek is chelate. means claw. So like a lobster claw might grab onto something. That's kind of the idea here is that chelating effect. So I'm kind of sensing a trend. Like originally we were looking at kind of simple structures, sodium chloride and so forth, and then more complicated minerals, and then organics, and now organometallics. So it seems like there's a lot of potential here to study – um, biologically relevant molecules, like proteins, DNA, the holy grail of biology. Right, and 
it was actually Linus Pauling who he comes back again after you know he introduced the idea initially of orbital hybridization during bonding, which is huge in organics and how atoms bond together and how their orbitals and electrons. I think he won the Nobel Prize for that for the or- hybridization of orbitals. Right. It, it's an incredibly incredibly important in terms of understanding how atoms bond together. You know, he also gave us a more accurate understanding of the means of measuring electronegativity. Um, but anyway, so he and this other guy, Corey, in 1950, they announce, they, they basically start studying all these proteins and trying to determine what sort of structures are existing in these. And he announces the conclusion of their of their efforts after these extensive studies, and they find the existence of a plane and two spiral structures as the primary element of protein configurations. And these become what are known as the alpha helix and beta sheets. And this really kicks off a major exploration and the eventual discovery of the DNA structure as we know it now. Now, Pauling, when he initially discovered this, he got it wrong. He actually thought it was a triple helix. Um, But as we know now, it is a double. One of the few times that Pauling got something wrong. I think we'll, we'll learn about another time he got it wrong a little later today. But, um. So this brings us to sort of the next step. Uh, biological systems, that again is, oh, every one of these things that we're talking about, there are like whole departments at universities studying these things now. They really became massive fields in and of themselves. Um, the next thing that they studied, we're now in like the late 50s heading into the 60s. Uh, there was a guy named David Green uh, with Vernon Ingram and uh, Perutz. All right, so late 50s now, we're moving into yet another field. We're looking at protein structures, which are also complicated, just like DNA. These things get really hard, and they came up with a totally new approach to this. What they did is they introduced what's called the replacement method. Replacement method means you swap out one atom with something else, and that something else interacts nicely with electrons, or x-rays, I mean, so that you can know where it is in the structure. So if you pull something out and you put a heavy atom like, say, a mercury into this crystal, all of a sudden, you observe a difference in the diffraction peak, and you say, aha, since it occurred, our diffraction pattern in a certain spot, and we, and we know that it bonded in a certain place, we know that's where this thing exists in the crystal. So this was a really powerful approach, and we're still doing things kind of like this today, actually. And it's all based off of this comparing the differences in intensity. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, William Bragg, when he heard about this, um, this was an important way to solve the sort of phase problem that Ben mentioned earlier. He loved this technique so much that he said the following quote. He said, the molecule takes no more notice of such an insignificant attachment than the Maharaja's elephant would care about the gold star painted on its forehead. I mean, the molecule doesn't care in some instances when you swap these things out, but it makes a big difference to the, electro- to, to the x-rays that are interacting with the material. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked earlier about structure-property relationships, and that's why we care about the structure. I think it's hard to think of any better example of structure property relationships than proteins. Like the the function of a protein is determined by its three-dimensional structure in space. So if you want to know how life works, how our cells get things done, you've got to know the structure of these proteins. X-ray crystallography and and neutron crystallography as well uh, in the meantime has, has been one of the most important things for understanding how life actually works on the cellular level because we can study protein structure in great detail. Absolutely. So, you know, they they said we can take an individual atom and we can swap out something with that atom. It wasn't, you know, just a few years later that Rossman and Blow, they basically said, they they did the same thing, but they said, let's swap out whole molecules at a time. They basically took chunks of the, the crystal out and swapped it out with another one. The same sort of approach, though, just a different replacement. So... We've talked about x-rays as a way to probe structure. We've talked about neutrons. That's not actually the only way we can uh, learn about structure materials. We can also use electrons, beams of electrons, to figure out the structure of materials. This is called uh, electron diffraction or electron crystallography. So just like neutrons, electrons also have uh, wave-like properties, and we can use that to, d- to come up with diffraction patterns. And but but how do we actually do that? How can we use electrons uh, effectively um, as as a a way to achieve uh, structure determination and do electron crystallography? So um, so very first thing you have to do is you've got to like get it going fast enough that the wavelength is about the right size mm-hmm. to be on on par with atomic arrangements. Right. So you you can make an electron gun, which is basically a metal you heat up and it's streaming off electrons. Then you accelerate those things by a couple hundred kilovolts. Like, these are really, really high energy uh, electrons now going really, really fast, have a really short wavelength. And then we can, we're on the, the wavelength scale of, uh, of the atoms. What else is really cool here is if you think about trying to actually magnify something, so you've got x-rays going in, 
the first thing they did uh, was actually magnification, so electron microscopy. So if you want to blow up an image, we know how to do that with light. You use lenses, the light converges, and then it basically expands again. We've got this larger image produced. We know how to do that with light. What we needed was a way to do that with electrons. So way back to the 1920s again, Hans Busch, he basically realized like, oh, you can use magnetic fields, right? These are, these are charged particles that are moving. Therefore, they experience the Lorentz force, right? You, you can basically make these things move with an applied magnetic field. And he corralled them. He basically made them squeeze together, focus on something, and then they expand again. And all of a sudden, you've got a larger image that you can collect, which is pretty remarkable. I never had thought about it just like light, but it's they create an electromagnetic lens, just like we use real lenses for light or physical lenses for light. So you have Ernst Ruska and you have Max Null, and they reason that it should be possible to, you know, obtain these uh, enlarged images basically by focusing the electron beam. And so they succeeded in making an apparatus based on this principle, and that's where we get the first electron microscope. And then in 1937, they team up with Siemens, and uh, who in 1939, through their, their research and their experiment and technology, they develop and deliver the first serially manufactured instrument capable of magnification of over 20,000 times. But one aspect of this, however, that really just wasn't explored was the phase information present in the diffracted electron beams. And this can be recovered by focusing them back onto a two-dimensional sort of real space project projection by means of these magnetic lenses of, electro of an electron microscope. And so what you get is you sort of get a 2D image of the phase. Yeah, if we, if we go back to the, the very first experiment that kind of kicked this all off, the Lowy experiment, mm -hmm. they're basically doing like little miniature Lowy experiments, but they're not using x-rays. They're using electrons. So in, in electron diffraction experiments, you can do it both in, in reflection and transmission. If it's transmission, you're literally blasting it right through your sample. So your sample's got to be darn thin because electrons get absorbed pretty easily in the material. But if they do go through your sample and you've got a detector on the back, it produces a two-dimensional image which shows the diffraction. And you can use that to figure out exactly what's there, which is actually a really powerful tool. And then in 1968, David de Rossier and Aaron Klug, they basically demonstrate that by starting from a, a limited set of these two-dimensional images, you can actually reconstruct an original like three-dimensional structure of the material you're looking at. They do this with the uh, bacteriophage T4, which is a common virus and they're able to see its structure. Pretty incredible. Um, the next big advancement comes in 1969. This one's near and dear to my heart because I love this technique. The guy's name is Hugo Rietveld. So Hugo Rietveld, he's working in the Netherlands Energy Research Foundation. And, you know, he, since he was m working most with nuclear materials, a lot of what he was doing was neutron diffraction. And he was one of the first people because he was a, a computer software programmer in the late 60s, right? We have software coming online. We have computers. Pretty cumbersome at the time, but we're starting to use them more and more. And he had this concept. He's like, okay, there should be a method that we're all doing guess and check. Why can't we do a guess and check that's driven by error minimization? So in other words, you're going to measure an x-ray diffraction pattern. Well, he was the first to really point out and say like, well, I can calculate every single point what the pattern should look like if you tell me a potential hypothetical structure. So what if I calculate it? We've got the real structure. What if I just compare those two? In fact, even better, what if I take the residual, meaning you take the observed minus the calculated, that's the residual, and then maybe you square it so it's more important to get the big peaks right than the background. All of a sudden, you have something that you can minimize in a least squares regression. So anybody who's done like a basic curve fitting in your algebra class in seventh grade, you've done a least squares regression. All he did was he applied it to an important system where it's, a, it's thousands and thousands of points. And what it allows you to do is now you can iteratively change your structure, maybe the lattice parameter, like how big that unit cell is. Maybe it's the position of your atoms or what type of atoms. You can change all these things iteratively, and it will refine it in a process that's least squares driven to minimize error. And at the end of it, you have a structure that is much better than any of your initial guesses because it's been iteratively changed in a controlled way. This is a big deal. This is still used all around. This is like, at least in my group, we do a ton of this. It's a big deal. Um, there's there's modern day versions, right, of software that are obviously much more advanced. For example, one of the best ones today comes out of um, the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Laboratory. Two guys, Brian Toby and Robert Von Drill, put that together. And it's just terrific software for now predicting structures in ways that we never were able to do before. I'm more of a full prof guy than a GSAS guy, but <laughs> I won't hold that against you. Carvajal's not a bad dude either. <laughs> I remember when you introduced me to GSAS. So this was this was when I was working in the characterization lab here, and Taylor was sort of managing our group and giving us experiments to do, and one of them was a, a right belt refinement. And keep in mind, this is before I had taken 
a serious <laughs> material science class. It was like I took I was taking like a one credit intro. I think one. he had like Gen Chem under his belt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. It was it was very simple. So I didn't even know what lattices were, lattice parameters, like crystal structures or anything. And so I'm trying to like work through this right belt refinement. <laughs> I think after like spending a bunch of hours on it, the lowest I got was like a forty for the like oh, yeah. R squared value. <laughs> I think I got a negative value at one point, and it was just it was a disaster. <laughs> so, you know, Refill's a powerful tool. We still use it today. Um, a few years later, now we're in the 70s, comes the birth of large-scale facilities. Ben, you're probably more, you know, suited to talk about these. Tell us about some of the birth of these things and why, why we should care about large-scale diffraction facilities. Yeah, this is super important. Uh, for myself personally, um, most of my research is done at large-scale facilities that are simply – too big, too expensive, too complicated for any one research group or even one university to run and operate. So we're talking about synchrotrons. Like these are these are these big circular uh, electron accelerators that that generate extremely high intensity. Uh, when you say big, I don't think listeners are going to realize just how big. These we're we're talking are. like uh, kilometers in circumference sometimes. Okay, so uh, you, you, you've probably heard of CERN, right? That that's the biggest. Uh, particle collider, particle accelerator on Earth. But a lot of these synchrotrons aren't too much smaller than that. So these are incredibly complex machines, um, which are you know a bi- on a billion-dollar budget type thing to, to construct. And there's no way that an individual research group or university could, could afford that. Um, but the, these national lab facilities, these large-scale user facilities, uh, pool resources from governments, and sometimes uh, these are international collaborations, to construct these incredible X-ray and neutron sources so that scientists can go use those facilities to do experiments. So what I do, I I sometimes make samples in the lab or sometimes get samples from collaborators like Taylor, and then we travel out, we, we submit a proposal to get beam time is what we call it. We travel out to these facilities and then we can do our experiments there using world-class, state-of-the-art instrumentation to get you know the, the highest quality uh, data you can imagine uh, and then we come back and analyze it. Now, this is so much more powerful than what you could get in a typical um, like lab-scale X-ray diffractometer. Those are really important tools as well. But if you want really high-quality data, if you need really high-intensity X-rays, uh, it, or if you need neutrons, you've got to go to these uh, large-scale facilities. And it's been amazing to see how these have progressed over the decades. You know, the first synchrotrons were, were uh, parasites off of particle physics experiments. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. So they had a big accelerator used for particle physics, and then you know people interested in structural science kind of had to beg for some scraps. Like you need time. to accelerate the electrons to get the particle physics to happen, like yeah. to kickstart it. Right. And so we're basically like, well, you know, <laughs> give us a little bit of those electrons, and we'll do cool things that are, you know, they would, the, the radiation coming off of those. Yeah, things. they would literally drill holes in the walls of this particle accelerator to get some of those X-rays coming off of the, the electrons. Incredible. And uh, but it was soon recognized how powerful these synchrotrons and other facilities can be, and so now we have dedicated uh, synchrotrons and and spallation neutron sources and neutron reactors, uh, which are dedicated for structural science, and they've really enabled a lot of great research over the decades. Yeah, we could not do the science we're doing today without those. Um, so fast forward a couple more years, we've got big new facilities, we've got tools like Refelt to really hone in on structures. What are we going to do with all these structures? we got to put them somewhere. People need to find them, compare them, you know, measure them. So there needs to be this birth of what are called open structures and crystallographic databases, right? So the early 70s, uh, it was actually protein crystallographers uh, were the first to basically do this. They basically said, like, we're all publishing these structures. Can we just put them somewhere? So at first they were mailing them in. They had these punch cards or magnetic tapes that they were sending via the mail to the centralized protein data bank, PDB. Um, and that's not a great option. It was really complicated. There's, you know, if somebody else wanted to see it, they had to like borrow the punch cards. These were really, it was not great. So a few years later in mid seventies, we've got Edgar Meyer at Brookhaven. And he was the first person who came up. He's like, okay, let's just make this a software thing. He built the software tools for both handling and visualizing uh, protein structure data. And a little bit later, he came up with a place to store them electronically at the PDB. Um, this was a big deal. This led to people saying, well, we can do this in all sorts of other fields, right? And we're still doing them today. So there are crystallographic databases for proteins, but also for, you know, other organic molecules, for inorganic structures. Um, And I use these things, if not on a daily basis, at least three or four times a week I'm using these things because it's so critical to learn from what other people have done so you don't have to reinvent the wheel as you're guessing at these structures every time. 
Yeah, so as much as the science uh, needed to be advanced, then there was the, the software needing to yeah, be advanced as well. Had and to meet it. Exactly. And, and then, you know, ways of sharing our knowledge. That's just as important for advancing the field as, as actually making the, the uh, scientific advancements as well. And just to put numbers on these things, in these databases, say something like the inorganic, inorganic crystal structure database, they're in the hundreds of thousands of entries. The, uh, the, the Cambridge one, I think it's in the millions now on organic molecules. So these are tons and tons of structures, which makes it a very powerful resource to screen potential new materials from. And in the in the era of, you know, big data, this is right along that that same uh, that same line. So you can you can do things like um test structures, uh you can you can write um write programs that will pull these structures from these databases and and do all sorts of you know, big data type analysis. So it's really really cool to to see how that planning back in the 70s is, has really been paying off all this time. Okay, so in the 1980s, crystallography was well established. You know, it'd been around uh, most of a century. Um, we felt like we had a pretty good understanding of how atoms are arranged in nature. Uh, that really changed with the discovery of um, Daniel Schechtman uh, originally. So he was looking at some uh, an alloy of aluminum, and he had he had processed it in kind of an interesting way. He had heated it up to really high temperatures and then cooled it really rapidly to prevent it from crystallizing into its normal crystal structure. And then he looked at it using electron diffraction, you know, looking at very small regions of the sample. And what he found was a, a very nice diffraction pattern, but it looked different than any diffraction pattern he'd ever seen in his life because it had tenfold rotational symmetry. Back at the beginning of this episode, we talked about even in the 19th century, mathematicians had figured out that there are only certain symmetries which will allow uh, complete periodicity while filling space. And they were one, two, three, four, and six. <laughs> Ten is not symmetry. one of them. Tenfold symmetry is not allowed. And yet, here was a clean diffraction pattern suggesting an ordered structure with tenfold symmetry. So it's not a crystal because it can't be truly period periodic, right? Mathematically, it's impossible to make a truly periodic structure that has tenfold symmetry. And yet, it's long-range ordered, giving diffraction peaks. So what do you call something that's not really a crystal, but kind of a crystal? You call it a quasi-crystal. So these are quasi-crystals, uh, which really change our understanding of how atoms can be arranged. So scientists didn't just, like, jump on board with this, right? This not was a all. This was a... Right, he was overturning something that was hundreds of years of established science. And he was putting forward data, right, which was a, a nice, clean electron diffraction pattern that showed this, but people didn't buy it. Like, there's some famous and really vocal critics, right? So Linus Howling. Pauling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he basically said, uh, he, he argued that, you know, <laughs> you know, he had this really harsh criticism. He said, there are no such things as quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists, <laughs> which is just brutal. <laughs> and he basically said, like, this isn't tenfold, it's two five-folds, and the, and the structure is twinned, and that's why you're seeing both. It's really like, it's basically saying, like, you're looking at two different structures on top of each other. This isn't truly a single crystal that has it. For a couple of years, I was alone. I was ridiculed. I was treated badly by my peers and my colleagues. And the head of my laboratory came to me and smiling sheepishly, and he put a book on my desk and said, Danny, why don't you read this and see that it is impossible what you are saying? And I said, you know, I teach this book. I don't need to read it. I know it's impossible, but here it is. This is something new. That person expelled me from his group. He said, you are a disgrace to our group. I cannot bear this disgrace. And he asked me to leave the group. So I left the group. And he was a good friend of mine. I mean, but he could not, he could not stand that people would say that this nonsense come from your group. This was the atmosphere. People not only did not believe in what I said, people were hostile. The community of non-believers was very large in the beginning. In fact, it included everybody. The leader of that group was Professor Linus Pauling, a two-time Nobel laureate. He was a very important figure and the idol of the American Chemical Society. And to his last day, he was standing on stages and published papers saying that Danny Schertmann is talking nonsense. Okay, so Pauling later said, you know, crystallographers can now cease to worry that the validity of one of the 
accepted basis of their science has been questioned. <laughs> and then Nature's editor, a guy named Jan Ma- John Maddox at the time, he said that Pauling had put a cat among the pigeons, right? Basically saying, like, this has been settled. Good thing an expert came in and told us what was happening here. But years go by. Schechtman doesn't back down. He says, this is really something. Keeps on fighting back. And eventually, he gets enough experimental evidence to overturn even Linus Pauling's, you know, criticism. And fi- famously, he says, you know, the pigeons have endured, you know, the cat, uh, you know, pestering them. And it's so, – so quasicrystals are real. The definition of a quasicrystal is a material with true long-range order of the atoms but no true periodicity. So it's something that simply had not been imagined before it was discovered. But there's a really interesting connection to mathematics. So Roger Penrose is a famous mathematician and physicist. And back in the 80s, you've, maybe you've heard of Penrose tiles. These are really cool-looking. M.C. Escher uses them in his drawings yeah. a lot. Yeah. These are, are cool-looking patterns which, uh, which fill space but are not actually repeating. You can't define a unit cell and just build that up to build your total structure. So um, quasicrystals are the basically the three-dimensional version of Penrose tiles, and there's, there's lots of interesting math uh, that comes along with that and, and a lot of a really rich physics to be studied as well. One thing maybe to, to define those is that they have a center and they can grow outward, but there is always that one center. They don't translate. It's always just growing outward as opposed to translating. Right. Um, so one last point on this before we leave it is Schechtman, you know, I remember I was in grad school when he got the Nobel Prize for this. It was in 2011. And I, I loved his said, you know, he wasn't super vindictive about what had happened to him. But he does say this. He says, even our greatest scientists are not immune to getting stuck in convention. Um, keeping an open mind and daring to question established knowledge may be, in fact, a scientist's most important character trait, which I just think is super cool. That is really cool. Um, So kind of uh, pushing the envelope some more, using x-rays to get even more information. We talked a lot about the difficulty of of distinguishing elements that are near each other on the periodic table with x-rays because x-rays usually just scatter from the core electrons. And if, you know, manganese and iron have almost the exact same number of core electrons, it's going to be hard to distinguish between them. But there was an idea. What if we change the energy of the x-ray or of the photon to match a transition for a given element, okay? So, you know, uh, electrons around atoms occupy certain orbitals, and if you send in a photon with the right amount of energy, you can excite an electron to a new orbital, and it'll absorb that photon. So if you can tune your incoming photon beam, your incoming X-ray beam, to match the energy of an electronic transition for a given element, then you'll get a really highly enhanced signal for that specific element. This is called resonant X-ray scattering. Resonant because you're tuning the energy to match or resonate with an internal energy scale of that particular atom. So this is a really powerful way, because it's pretty easy actually to tune the energies of X-rays at synchrotrons at least. You can focus in on certain elements and certain transitions within those elements to study those elements specifically. And this, so this resonant X-ray technique has been extremely useful uh, for not only determining atomic structures, because as I said, you can highlight certain types of elements over others, um, but also for looking at magnetism with X-rays, which before was basically impossible. You know, we we only relied on neutrons to study magnetism. But now, um, if you tune your X-rays to to be uh, to have the right energy, you can actually look at the magnetism of certain elements as well. So if you have a, a material containing iron or copper or manganese or something that's magnetic, you can tune your X-ray energy to probe those electrons responsible for the magnetism and get really detailed information about the magnetic structure using X-rays. So we've covered a ton of stuff. Um, we've clearly talked about different types of techniques, whether it's electron diffraction, X-ray, neutron, and now there's all these different tunable versions of those, like resonant, you know. like So there's been a ton of tools, and we're not done. Every year there are new advances in diffraction and crystallography. Um, one of the more exciting ones that's on the horizon, you know, in the last 20 years or so has been this idea of X-ray free electron lasers. And I'm just going to read this section so I don't get it wrong. But it says, in X-ray free electron lasers – a highly compressed electron bunch traveling through a periodic magnetic array generates photons, which interact back with the electrons, causing microstructuring of the bunch. And these microbunches then radiate coherently, hence why they call it a laser, because they're all radiating at the same, you know, coherently, so the same wavelength. 
creating X-ray pulses of unprecedented brilliance. Um, so we're using these things to push the boundary and examining things that, for example, are very low crystallinity that would never give us any sort of diffraction patterns. We now have a tool that we can use to look at these things. One of the challenges is it's so bright and powerful, it destroys a lot of samples. So there's still some things to be done here, but if you think that we're done with diffraction, think again. Every year I see cool new advances, and I see traditional old materials being understood in new ways using the emerging techniques. So, you know, crystallography, it's, it's over 100 years old, but it is by no means a, a dead field. It is still uh, changing. It's still developing. There's a lot of great work to be done. And who knows, the next major breakthrough, sustainable energy, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the next uh, wonder material, like cancer treatment, you know, the, the next breakthrough drug, I can almost guarantee you structural science, crystallography is going to play an important role in that. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode. You know, if you liked this stuff, you want to learn more, we really gave you the, we gave you like the abbreviated Cliff Notes version. There's a lot more. Check out the Nature uh, Milestone series on crystallography. We'll have a link in our show notes. It's pretty fascinating. There's a lot more, you know, behind the scenes stories about the lives of the scientists who made these discoveries. And as always, if you've got questions or feedback, we're happy to read your email. Send it to materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we always love it if you'll subscribe, subscribe, rate, like our shows on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, really anywhere else you want to find us. Uh, leave a review. helps people find our show. Um, lastly, you can check out our Instagram page. That's at materialism.podcast. You can connect with us there. Tell us what new episode we should talk about. And thanks again to the people that provide the music for this podcast, Colobite and Alphabot. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. 